Welcome to this little session on performance profiling and troubleshooting and figuring out when things go wrong, why do they go wrong. I've named it Who Done It, and so I ran into a little what do you call them? Smart rest shop earlier to figure out get some props, but all I could get was this little pipe. So I hope that's going to be all right. I'm going to try and use this to look smart and look like a detective throughout. And I hope you can at least appreciate that. But so let's get started. Ah, nice. This one doesn't work again. Perfect. Give me a second. We can do this. We can find out who did it this time as well. Wait, it does work. There we go. So before we sort of dive into this whole thing, it's just nice for you to know a bit about who I am so you know what I'm talking about and maybe know more about what I'm talking about than I do. Anyway, my name is Thomas Hartman. It says developer, developer, developer. Although now it's probably more correct to say dev relations and community because I recently started a job as a developer community manager. Previously, I've been a developer for a couple of years. I've done a bit of everything like from the front end to the back end. Definitely not an expert in any of it but I like it and it's good fun. The most important thing is I really, really like learning. And that is also sort of how I came into doing this talk. Now, it says here that I'm the co-organizer of the Rust Oslo Meetup Group. If anyone's interested and want to learn more about that, come let me know. I'm sorry I didn't bring any stickers today. I forgot my home, so that's not going to happen. But the last point there is quite important. And it says that I'm quite explicitly not a performance guru. So why then am I giving this talk if I don't really know what I'm talking about? And that goes back to the first point. I really, really like learning. As a lot of people do, I thought, oh, you know what? That sounds like a fun thing. Let's do a talk on it and then learn as we go about. Now, where did the idea come from? And to tell you about that, I need to introduce you to these two fellas. Dave Rupert and Chris Coyer of The Shop Talk Show. Shop Talk Show is a podcast all about front-end web design and development. It's run by Dave Rupert down on the right and Chris Coyer up on the left. Now, in episode 471, if you want to go look it up, it's about a minute 50. So it's about half a year ago. They said, you know what? They were talking about performance and profiling, and suddenly they said, ah, it's like, it's like a mystery, right? It's like the only sort of mystery we have in our business. It's like a whodunit. I thought, you know what? That sounds really fun. What's this? Maybe I can use this to create a talk, because it sounds like something that would be fun to do. Uh, and so that's how I ended up here. Now, this talk is language agnostic, or at least it's supposed to be. It doesn't say anything in the brief or the little summary you got about what language it's in, because it really doesn't matter. Well, it matters a little bit, but the tools we're using today something you can use everywhere and not just in one specific language. And it's all about the mindset and how you actually work with it. That's what we're looking for. Oh, and uh, before we go any further, I'd just like to tell you that the events depicted in this talk are fictitious and that any similarity to any person living or dead is merely coincidental. Also, no animals were harmed in the making of this talk. So, I, know, I mean, I know this usually comes at the end, but no one's going to stay for the credits anyway, so I just thought I'd get it out of the way, yeah? Um, so let's talk about the setup. Let's set the scene and get things going. Now, because this is sort of a murder mystery, of course it starts on a dark and stormy night. Now, if you read the little summary about the talk, you might think, oh, well, I thought we were on a boat, I thought we were on a cruise. That's fine. If you want to be a detective on a cruise, you be a detective on a cruise. If you want to be in some big, dark, gritty city, you do that. If you want to be in a French castle, cool. Whatever detective you want to be, now's your chance to be one. Um, and in this case, this is actually even before the murder. Because you're just sitting there, clacking gleefully away on your keyboard, as you do. You know, you're a developer, you do things, you implement things, and then the product manager comes through the door. <gasps> oh, no. See, you used to have a service that simply took some JSON, transformed it, and spat it back out. Super simple, super easy. Uh, but now, as product is wont to do, they give you additional requirements. Now, for the sake of this story, this piece of JSON is just a list of tickets or objects that need to be done. And so each ticket has a, it's a bit of where you go and get it, what you're getting, and who it's assigned to. As it turns out, the list you get in can contain duplicates. 
But we don't like duplicates because a person can only do one thing at a time, so it has to be deduplicated. Next, we like to sort the output. We want a list, but we want it sorted. That makes it easier for people to read through it manually, I guess. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it's product. Don't question it, just do it. Last thing, oh, we need to make some changes because right now, the target string actually contains three separate sections. We like to split them out to make it easy to read. Now, I'll make this clear for you. This is the data that we're getting in. This is the JSON object that we're transforming. It's got a target, it's got an ID, and it's got an assigned to. Originally, in version one, the one that we had, all it does is remove the ID because we don't want to leak that out to whomever is reading the data in. So it was a super simple transformation, just remove ID. You could basically just read it in and write it back out. Now, we want this to turn into this. So assigned to stays, but you need to split target into three separate strings. So as you can tell, you sort of split it on the colon and you just say, ah, oh, it's this field, this field, and that field. Again, it's to make it easy to read and you don't really question it. Product says, do it, you do it. You think, oh, that's fairly simple, right? We can do that pretty quickly. Sit down, smack something out in like about an hour, write some tests, don't think too much about it. Um, and then you hear the screech from down the hall because something really isn't working right. There's been a bit of a murder. You see, it turns out that version two is up to 45 times slower than the actual first implementation. And that is quite a lot. But so when you were implementing this, you thought, ah, oh, okay, well, we gotta do this, we gotta do this, you gotta do this, some tests here, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. You never really gave it much thought, because you know, you, you don't you're not supposed to think about performance when you're writing, you just write whatever is simple and easy to read and easy to understand, and use that. Uh, you know, cross the bridge when you get there, performance pre premature optimization, yada yada yada. Now, I I just want to say I do not recommend you think about performance all the time while writing. That is not really the way to go about it, because you need to know what is actually expensive, what takes time. But so maybe while you were writing, maybe you did some couple like small performances, that you run the same for 10 elements. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it doesn't really matter. Um, but much like this dog, you sort of sat there and there's just all fire all around you, it's burning. You can say this is fine as much as you want. But people, it really, it wasn't fine, not at all. So, we need ourselves a little investigation. And this is where the fun starts. So, the first thing we do is we gather all the suspects. We get them in together in one room, and we look them all straight in the eye. We don't, but we make a list of potential people. Now, these people do all not exist. They're pulled from this person does not exist, so if they look like someone you know, they're probably not. And if they are, I'm very sorry. Um, these are common things that might cause performance issues. This is not a definitive list. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just here are things that might cause issues. But we start this thing, right? We know our application a little bit. What can we do? What can we know already may or may not be an issue. First off, we know there's, there's no SQL, there's no network calls. We can rule that out completely. It's fine. Second, we know the application's single-threaded. That's not an issue. Now, we also know a little bit about the application and what the language it's written in. I didn't tell you, but I know that it is written in Rust. Now, what this means is that because Rust has no runtime, uh, it also doesn't have reflection, which is a runtime thing, so it can't be that. Also, Rust isn't garbage collected, so you can't be garbage collection. And now we're left with five little suspects. So, now that we have a little list of people it might be, let's do some actual benchmarking and figure out what's going on. So, the term benchmark is, I didn't really know how old I thought it was, but it's apparently from 1838 and used in a figurative sense in the 1880s. It's fun if you like etymology, I do. Um, anyway, what it is, is, is a way to measure the performance of a program. And you usually do it by running the program and then measuring the output. It's got some good pros. It gives you a lot of sort of a 
relative overview of how well something runs. So you can run multiple versions of the same algorithm, you can run the same algorithm on different computers, and so on and so on, depending on whether we want to benchmark hardware or software. But as a con, it can also vary a lot based, one thing is, what's your hardware like? And the other, are you doing anything else? Say you're running benchmarks. If you're also playing a video game on the same computer, that's going to mess things up, because you've only got so much computing power to you know, throw out the benchmarking. So you need to, or you should try, and keep it as stable as you want, or as possible between benchmarks. Now, if you're using Rust, this is just in that case, and that's, this is what I've been using here. I've been using Criterion as a benchmarking tool, and CritComp as a way to compare them. Now, the output of those two things looks a bit like this. So here, I've benchmarked for running the program, the algorithm, on 10 elements, on 100 elements, on 1,000 elements, on 10,000 elements, where there's only 997 unique ones, on 10,000 elements, where there's 10,000 unique ones, 20,000 elements, where there's 10,000 unique, and 100,000 elements with maximum roughly 1,000 unique ones. And how this works is you've got three columns. The group explains what's been run. V1 is the first version of the algorithm. V2 is the second one. The fact that V1 is all in green means that V1 was the fastest run for all of these trials. And so the column directly under V2 means, OK, this took 1.07 times as long, or this took 3.95 times as long to run. Uh, and we've got some interesting properties here. So for 10 elements, they're actually roughly the same. It doesn't really matter much, right? For 100 elements, suddenly you take about 60% longer. Then for 1,000 elements, you take almost four times as long. That's really bad. But then suddenly, when you have 10,000 elements, but only 1,000 unique ones, suddenly you're not doing that bad anymore after all. You haven't quite caught up. You're still 76% slower, but it's not as bad. So that might give a little hint as to what might be happening there. But now, if you've got 10,000 unique elements, suddenly it takes 15 times longer to run version 2. And then my favorite is 20,000 elements, but only 10,000 unique ones. It takes 45 times as long to run version 2. Now, we'll get into this and try and figure out what happens here. But before we get into looking at actual code and how it works, I want to bring up another tool that is useful for troubleshooting when something goes wrong and you're not sure exactly where it went wrong. Because this thing happened over multiple commits, you don't know exactly where things got introduced. And that tool is git bisect. Um, and git bisect is a tool that obviously you need to be working with git, but I assume most people are. There are other options for version control systems, and they're all valid, and they're all cool in their own right, but a lot of people use git. I like git. Now, git bisect is an implementation, or it's a tool in git that uses binary search. Binary search is an algorithm which has a big O notation, and that is the worst case runtime is O log N. Now, if this doesn't tell you anything, you might not be familiar with or comfortable with big O. That what it does mean is that if you've got up to 127 elements, it'll take you at most seven steps to get there. Likewise, if you've got 255, it's at most eight steps to find the one single commit that you were looking for. It's really, really useful and gets you where you need to go really fast. But it only works if the collection is sorted. Now, this talk, obviously, is about using it in Git and in code in general, but also, I find it to be quite useful in day-to-day -day stuff. So my editor's config file is six and a half thousand lines long. That sounds a bit excessive, but it is what it is. Now, it's written in Lisp, so if there's an extra closing parenthesis somewhere, how do I know? If I type a parenthesis and then everything just breaks and I save it, I didn't, didn't really check it, right? You try, try and start the editor up later and just doesn't work, how do you find it when there's one character in six and a half thousand lines? 
binary search works really, really well here too. So you say, oh, I don't know where it is. You got a whole file, you comment out or you delete half of it and see, does it work? If it does work, if everything does run, cool, you know the error was in the bit you deleted. If it doesn't, you know it's in the first bit. And you just keep on halving and halving and halving and you find the end result really, really quickly. Now, about Git bisect, I know it's a bit scary. It's one of those tools that I've heard and heard a lot about and people always sing its praises. But I've never really used it um, before this. So it was a fun little thing to learn and to try. And what it does is, it, as I said, it lets you search through your commits based on the binary search algorithm. What you have to do is you need something to tell Git, is this a good state or a bad state? Is this a good commit or a bad commit? Does this break it or does it not? Uh, and then at each commit, you can check whether the state is good or bad. Now, this is quite abstract. And because I've never used it before I wrote this talk, and I've heard people talk about it, I wanted to take a minute and just actually show you how it works so we can run through it. So it's a little bit of interactive right here for you. Oh, this doesn't work well at all. It's better this way. All right, so here, as you can see, we've got a list of commits on the left, and we've got a terminal on the right. I'm going to do this in the terminal. You can use a GUI for it, I'm sure, and there's multiple ways to do it. Um, and we know that in here, this might take a little bit of building, but um, that's what you do in Rust. You build a lot. It takes time sometimes, hopefully not too much. Anyway, we know that in this list of commits, right now, the tests are failing. Um, there is a failing test. It says tests, failing tests. And yes, I did that, that just so we could do this. But um, let's try and figure out where it's from. So to start a se session, you say git bisect start. And now, we got it. now we're telling Git, okay, we're doing bisection now. Help me out. So the first thing we do is we tell Git what's a bad state. And we know that our current commit, like the main branch, the tip of the main branch, is bad. So we say git bisect bad. We also know that on the left here, uh, the one that says v1, that one worked. We know that much. So we can say, okay, we can use that. We can say git bisect good and put in the sha. Cool. It now says there's 11 revisions left to test, and it'll take roughly four steps. So it now is automatically checked us out in, if we jump here, you can see that it can move all the way down here. And it shows us that the top one is bad, there's a good one, and the at is where we're at. So we're halfway through. We run cargo test to see, hmm, does this work or does it not? Again, it's a little bit of building. It's not too bad. It's been worse. And then if the tests pass, they do, we can say, good. Git bisect, good. Then it puts us at the commit that says add failing tests. Wow, this, this sounds very, very hopeful. This might be good. Let's try this one out. Ah, uh, ba, 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 ba. So if this one's bad, then we'll be a lot closer. It is bad. <gasps> Who would have thought, right? So we can say git bisect, this is bad. Now, that means we're getting closer. Git knows it's bad, but it doesn't know it's the first bad one. So obviously you've got to test again. Oh, and this one's good. And we're really inching towards it here. The last step is the one commit before the one we found that was bad. So we check this one too. Is this one good or is this one bad? This one's good. That means whoop, that git tells us this is the first bad commit. This is where it happened. Now, in this case, I ran a script uh, and using uh, just regular tests. We could have done this with performance profiling, but that takes a bit longer. And I thought, well, let's just show you how it works. Also, I did all the steps manually now. Thankfully, you don't have to. If you have a script 
that outputs a, or either exits successfully or unsuccessfully, you can have Git run that automatically at every commit as it checks them out and then find everything for you, which makes it much quicker. But this is actually how it works. I know I would have appreciated that, so I hope some of you did. And if not, yeah, it's there for posterity. Anyway, using that, we can find things. That leaves one more tool in our arsenal. I mean, there's loads of them, obviously, but the ones that we're going to use today, and that is flame graphs. Now, to talk about flame graphs, let's first talk about this guy, Brendan Gregg. Here he is shouting his lungs out at a server in a data center. This video is from 2009. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but he's actually in the data center going and really just yelling at the various servers. And the reason he's doing that is they're monitoring the performance. So he's got a program that's checking write performance, read performance, and at the same time he's going and shouting at the servers. And what he finds is he creates a, or a notable spike in the time it takes to write. So showing that sound waves, shock waves, can impact the performance of writing in the data center. So here's a slightly better or a more flattering photo of him, where he's not just looking into a bunch of servers. Uh, he, Brandon Gregg, is a so-called internationally renowned expert in computing performance, and he's done loads and loads and loads of stuff. I think he's currently working for Netflix, but he's also been with Sun, Oracle, and so on. And he's relevant because he invented flame graphs. He was the one who created them. Or at least that's what he says, and that's what the internet says. So, a flame graph. What is a flame graph? Well, it's what you see on the right here. Apparently, he invented them in 2011 when he was working on a MySQL performance issue and had to understand CPU such quickly and in depth. Flame graphs let you visualize stack traces. And the way they work is, as a graph, there's an x-axis that goes along and there's a y-axis that goes up and down. On the x-axis, the stacks are sorted alphabetically. And then on the y-axis, you get the stack depth. So every time a function calls another function, it adds a layer to the y-axis. Um, now, the x-axis is not sorted according to when something's run or how, or how long it takes. It is sorted according alphabetically. But what we do know is that the wider a box is, the longer it took to run, the more time it's spent on the CPU. And that's what you get to measure with flame graphs. And just because it's cute, if you flip them upside down, they're called icicle graphs, because they sort of look like icicles. This is also really, it's all, it's really all a matter of preference. Some people like to start looking at the top and then see what's got the deepest icicle. Some people prefer looking at flames. Anyway, what happens is, as you see in this full flame chart, you don't have to read this, that's fine, it's just, it's just a visual. But at the bottom, you have wider boxes, and they get narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. Because everything comes from that first call, right? And then, so that takes up, spends a whole lot of time on the CPU on itself and its descendants. So what you'll also notice is some of these are really thin and really tall. And some, not as tall and quite wide. And that is obviously because of how they work. Now, there are other options as well to flame graphs. Flame graphs may measure CPU time. Sometimes that is not optimal. That's not really what you want to measure because it might be impacted by a lot of things, such as you're running other processes, or maybe you suddenly you unplug your laptop and it's on battery power and the CPU doesn't run as fast, right? So instead, you can do stuff like count CPU instructions. That might be more appropriate, but then again, that might miss things if, it's, if you're doing um, I.O. or performance, sorry, I.O. or something where it's not on the CPU, where it's not CPU cycle-based, but it spends time on the CPU anyway. So we'll be using flame graphs today because it's easy, it's pretty intuitive, and it's fun. So now that we've got the tools, We've done a little bit of bisection. We know where we're going. Can we crack the case? Here is the flame graph for 
when we run with unique elements from 10 to 10,000. So it's 10 unique elements, 100 unique elements, 1,000 and 10,000 unique elements. Again, I don't expect you to be able to read this. I can't read this from where I'm standing. So I've taken the liberty of annotating it for you to give you a rough overview of what's happening. And so going from the left, we see that, oh, okay, there's a bit of allocation going on here. It's mostly allocating vectors. It's, it's a little bit of time. It's not really that much. Deserializing, apparently that takes a surprising amount of time. It's about 20% mm, or so. Serializing does not take as long. It's good to know. Oh, but this one, deduplication. That's a big one. That's about, what, half the time, roughly, it's spent deduplicating? That sounds really, really bad, doesn't it? That's really bad. Oh. There's a tiny bit of cloning, which is doing deep copies, so copying something from the heap and putting somewhere else on the heap. Um, there's a little bit of converting what we have into the structs we use, and there's a little bit of sorting, but not much. Here, uh, obviously, deduplication is really, really bad, but this is for unique elements, right? When you've only got unique elements in a list. What happens when you've got 20,000 elements, but only 10,000 unique ones. Yeah. Deduplication goes through the roof. Everything else is absolutely unimportant. Uh, so that makes us think, huh, maybe we should get the, uh, the suspects back in the room. Um, and see, well, okay, who can we rule out now? We know, because IO didn't even appear, it's not IO. There were a little bit of allocations, so maybe they didn't quite like performance, or, but they, didn't, they definitely didn't kill it. Now, D. Serializing and deserializing did take a lot of time, absolutely. And there's some deep-rooted hatred in there, definitely, but it wasn't the worst thing. Now, we're left here with algorithms and data structures. They're commonly noticed, or they're commonly talked about in pairs, like those two go together, and they do really influence each other a lot. So I think that there might be a little double murder going on. But, so we take them in, and we tie them up, we see, try and see who really killed performance here. And it was me. I wrote the algorithm, so obviously I'm the one who did it. Um, it was me all along, and I would have gotten away with the two if it wasn't for you meddling kids. So that thing, always remember, it's not really the functions. It's about what you do and how you measure it and all do that. But the good thing in software, when something dies, we can bring it back. Let's see what we can do to fix things. I did not bring a firefighter uniform, but so I'll stick with my little pipe instead. At least we will try to fix it. Now, as we saw, the really, really worst thing was deduplication. Click. Can we fix that? Here is the first version of the algorithm. It's in, in, or this is in version two, so the first deduplication. Now, I'm not gonna go super in depth here, but what we do is we get a list, or a vector, as you call them in Rust, of the input elements. We then take this, reverse it, we allocate a new vector, and then for every element in the input, we check, does this ID exist in the output vector? If so, don't do anything, and if it doesn't, insert it. Obviously, this is gonna give us a really bad runtime. It's a quadratic runtime, so that's O and square. That's gonna take a lot of time. Um, there's also a bit of cloning and unwrapping going on before sorting. So this is just really, really bad. But can we, how best to get rid of this? Thing is, in Rust, if you wanna sort, or if you wanna deduplicate a vector, the best way is to have it sorted, but we can't sort it because we need it by time instead. So because the vector has all the events in the order that they happened, we can't sort them by the assignee before we deduplicate them. So we need to deduplicate and then sort. But thing is, data structures, right? Aren't they great? We've got something called sets or maps. 
And they have, as their property, they can only contain one element per, or they have unique elements, right? You can't have two of a thing in a set. And in a map, you can't have two things at the same key. So using a map, just pushing everything into a map, we can say, okay, well, allocate a new map, and then check, has this thing been inserted into the map before? If it has, don't do it. Now, I said that we, because the vector is time ordered, and we want the last elements because they have the right assignees, we need to iterate from the back. But we don't have to reverse the vector because, again, sorry, this is a bit Rust specific, but Rust lets you iterate from the start or from the end. So if you just start, start at the end, just iterate all the way around, we just need to check whether it contains the element yet or not. Obviously, you can't say if it is contained, then replace them. And I tried that originally. Turns out, I mean, it's faster, but checking whether the map contains a key before trying to insert it gains even more speed. Now, doing it this way, you end up putting it into a map, then back into a list, and then sorting the list. That sounds like a lot of work and doesn't sound amazing. But, or at least so I thought, so I had a good idea. How about we use an ordered map, right? Because, well, it's like a hash map, but it's sorted by descending value. And I thought, ah, oh, that's really clever, Thomas. You've cracked the case. This is a good one. Turns out uh, it wasn't very good at all. Because um, the time you spend on insertion just is too much. It takes too long to sort it when things go in. So I tried many, many iterations of this, because I thought, oh, but it's, it, it makes sense. It would be so nice if you could just have it sorted automatically. But nah, it doesn't work. Doesn't work. Another thing, uh, and this gets to when talking about the stack and the heap and Rust string types. Um, the question is rhetorical, how many types does it have? I don't really know. But the ones you do see in common usage are string and stir. That's what, I got, that's what I'm going to call them, the str, stir. And these have different purposes. The string lives on the heap. The stir lives on the stack. Now, just very quickly, yeah, uh, the heap is, you need to allocate stuff on the heap. That's where you've got large data structures. We don't know how big they are, where they can grow, they can shrink, and all that stuff. That's why the string lives on the heap, because you can grow it, you can mutate it, you can do what you want with it. A stir is just a pointer. Now, we know how large a pointer is, so we can put it on the stack. We don't need to allocate memory for it, because we know exactly how large it is. That makes it a lot lighter to work with and easier. Now, the funny thing is, a stir can point to a string, but it isn't a string. The ampersand in the name, stir, is because it's a reference, so you don't really own it. Again, sorry, this is a bit sort of rusty, but the important thing here is, you don't need to, if, if you have a string already, you don't need to clone it and create an, and allocate new memory and put it on the heap. You can say, oh, I'm just pointing to this string. This is where I'm at. And the sort of genius thing here as well, you don't need to point to the whole string. You can point to little sections. It's like you create a little window. Here is this bit of the string that I want to point at. And then you can take a large string and create many small ones. And the small ones will be super light. So creating windows. In the original version, the, the target struct, where we had the location, the object ID, and the code, all used strings. Now, strings, as I said, live on the heap. They are owned. You need to allocate for them, and you don't really know how large they are. So this is why, on the flame graph, the allocation bit just completely went away. Obviously, it wasn't as big as the duplication, but it's a thing that might, you might take away. So instead of using strings and allocating and copying and doing all that stuff, we can just point to where it comes from. We got this big JSON string. No, this is between these two indices in the string and work with it that way. The weird apostrophe A here, by the way, this is Rust's lifetimes. If you don't know, don't worry about it. It's complicated, but useful when you get used to it. So, cool, we got Windows, but because we're doing a lot of string manipulation, or not manipulation, but we're cutting a lot of strings, right? 
we got like 10,000 strings coming in, and each one we got to split. So I thought, huh, how long is the piece of string, and how long does it take to cut it? So we're splitting this string over here, or over there, into three, and we're splitting it on colons. So I thought, oh, how about we actually try and write and see, profile that as well, see what's faster. I came up with four sensible ways of doing that. I'm not going to really go into explain it to you, because it's quite code specific. We can look at them later if you want to. But it's two main ways. One is using a string split method. You say, I'll oh, split the string on colons, then you iterate over it because you get a list back, and you can iterate and go, give me this one, give me this one, give me that one. The other version is the more basic, perhaps. You go, go in and look for the index of the first colon. You go in and look for the index of the last colon. And you, go, and you, just, use, and you just cut the slices, use substrings, right? And you say, oh, well, it's between this and between that. And it turns out the last version, where you manually go and find the index of the characters that you want, is quite a bit faster. So the slowest version is, what, three times as slow as the fastest version? And the funny thing is, uh, this is just in this case, it's not a general thing, that the height of the flame graph, the flames, actually correspond to the runtime. So the, the one that takes the longest run has the tallest bit, and so on and so on. So now that we know this, we've made a couple changes. Can we return back to the flame graph and see how things have changed? And this is what it looks like in the new version. Uh, here is annotated for you. As we can see, now deserialization takes up a lot more space than it did previously. It's almost half the graph, right? And then there's a little bit of serialization, and there's some sorting going on. The other bits are inserting into the hash map, and that's main, mainly actually deduplication and insertion. And there's finally, there's converting the input into structs and creating the data structure we need. Um, What's interesting here is I haven't touched the serialization or deserialization code. I use a pretty standard library in Rust for that. It is the go-to, I'd say, it's called Survey. It's really, really good, but it takes time. Now, that might just be the cost of entry, right? Because at some point, you can't really go faster. But because we haven't touched deserialization or serialization code, we can put this up against the flame graph we had before. Now, we know that, in this case, uh, the deserialization should be roughly, it should take as long in time, so CPU time should be as much. But that means we can get relatively, see what's happened. So before, it took about, yeah, 20% of the time spent serialization, and the rest was on other stuff. Now it's about 50. So that means that while we don't get exact numbers, it means that everything else has to be done a lot, lot faster. And this is sort of what happens, because in the end, you know, there's always, always going to be slowdowns when you do more. The more things you want to do, the more computation you have to do, obviously it's going to take longer. So that's something you've got to take into account. It's always going to be a thing. But you can try and find out what's causing issues, might be causing issues, and find things you can do, or maybe things that you cannot do as well. So, I ran the benchmarks again. They're not sorted as beautifully as they were before. I'm sorry about that. But so we've got this group here, and we've got four versions. Version one is the one that just strips ID and then prints it out again. Or literally, all it does, serialize it, then deserialize it again. Version two, that's the horrible, horrible, horrible one with the absolutely terrible deduplication code. Version three is mostly what we've been talking about. But the difference between version 3 and version 4 is how we insert into the hash map. Whether we check first before we insert and iterate from the back, or whether we just insert again whenever we find the new key. So in version 3, we iterate through the vector in order from top. And you say, ah, oh, I just, just insert this, and Rust will 
if the key exists already, Rust will swap it out and put the new object there instead. Now, in version 4, we go from the back, we check for the key first. The interesting thing to note here is there's seven benchmarks. Version 1 wins in three of them. Version 4 wins in four of them. This is not to say that version 4 is better. Let's look at what they're actually doing. So the top one, 20,000 elements, 10,000 unique ones, right? This is one of the ones that version 4 does better. Uh, version 1 is slightly slower, but remember what we found out, that serialization and deserialization takes a lot of time. Version 1 did not do any deduplication, it just printed everything out again. So when you print out 20,000 elements and write those to a file, that's going to take you longer than it is to deduplicate and write the 10,000 elements out to a file. Similarly, for 10 elements, that's such a small sample that I don't really know. It's not really relevant. And if you look at the, the plus minus ones, uh, version 1 goes down to about 35, whereas version 4 goes down to about 38. So it doesn't really matter as such small sizes. At 100 elements, it starts to become noticeable because uh, they're all unique. And then version 1, faster than version 4, but not by a lot. So version 4 is about 13% slower compared to version 2, which at here took an extra 60%. Better. 1,000 elements, similar story. It's about 44% slower compared to four times slower, that is 300% slower than version 2 was. Definitely better. Again, vers no, version 4 is faster for 10,000 and 100,000 elements when there's only 1,000 unique ones. Serialization, right? And then finally, when there's 10,000 unique ones, version 1 is faster again, but not by a whole lot. So it takes 30% longer to do all of that extra processing compared to the original, which was 15 times. So like, as a summary, the less you do, the faster it's going to be. The less things you have to calculate, it's obviously faster. And that's why version 1 always wins when there's only unique items. When there are duplicates, it's going to be, and you need to get them out, obviously version 4 is going to be faster. So all this to say that you need to know what your code is doing and what it needs to optimize for. You need to know what the hot code paths are so you know what it's worth optimizing. So the allocation thing, the string thing I did, it's not really worth a whole lot, but to me it was funny, it was something I wanted to look into. But obviously the deduplication is that on the whole thing. A thing we could do here, because serialization takes that long, is look into are there better ways of serializing? Are there better serializers, deserializers? I keep messing those up by the way, I mean deserialization because that's the biggest one. But serialization too. Can we make that faster? This is an external library. Do, are there faster ones that serve the same purpose? And so it's all about trying to figure out what you need to do for your code to run where it is. But now I've given you a couple tools, and we've looked at them and had a little bit of fun, a couple of laughs, and that's really all I can give you today. So thank you very much for coming along. And any questions and stuff, well, I'm happy to take them. I shouldn't really applaud myself, should I? It's a bit dodgy. All right. Any questions at all? No? All right. In which case, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the conference as much as you can. And have a great weekend.